Jared said something last week, and he said it about four or five times in the podcast, that I thought was very important about what this is all about, what Jesus is asking us to do. So who can solve the equation? Who can solve the riddle? Right off the bat. And I'll start filling in words, and then you start, you start, you tell me. I'm going to start. Should we raise our hands? Or just no, just can can I get, it out. Can I get an F? Jesus is calling us to the heart of God. Well, okay, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Like that. That's close. Jesus is right. Calls. 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 Can I get a U? <laughs> <laughs> a U? Heart of There's no the Lord. U. Oh. Heart of the Lord. That's going to be on the podcast. So Jesus can that. It's not heart. Is it heart? heart? Character. Heart. Character. Character. Right. Of God. Or no, of the God. Of the Lord. Of the Lord. Of the Lord. Father. Father. Oh. Yeah. Nice. He wasn't even here. Oh. That was a blind spot. He didn't have to come anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh, good. I thought that was a good, uh, good description of what uh, the whole thing is about. The Beatitudes, the, the whole... Uh, section on the Sermon on the Mount, and so I thought, well, that's that's a good way to phrase it. And um, so, anyway, we, we wanted to move on today to chapter one, chapter six. Hey, we're going to move on to chapter six, and it kind of continues in the same vein as some of the things, and, and I've written down a couple of things here that, that will connect to some of the things we're looking at today. But um, the first thing it says in, let's see, what does it say in the ESV? I got charitable deeds. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. Is that what it says? Uh, practice your righteousness. Yeah. Okay. In, a, in, the NI, in the ESV, it says practice your righteousness. And the one, the one I use, it says do not your charitable deeds Looking up what this means, the, the, the same word that is used right here, um, this word, merciful, and this word mercy, the word that is translated as charitable deeds or righteousness is the word really mercifulness, the things you do for other people. And so... So Jesus is telling them, when you do this thing that constitutes your mercifulness, carrying this out, okay, being merciful, and, and in, in the, some of the older translations that use the word alms, giving alms, and if you watch old movies, they'll say alms for the poor. It's just giving people, poor people something, money or, or food or something. So... Jesus is, is telling the, the people in that day, take heed, be, be careful that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Okay? So he says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be, may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So this is fairly straightforward. Um, he's, telling them, he's, he's telling them, don't do what you're doing to be seen by other people. He's saying... He's saying there is there is something that you the things you do as as a, well, it says practice righteousness in, in your uh, in some translations or well, however you want to do this the thing that the outward form of your righteousness don't do it to be seen by other people and uh, that's fairly straightforward but if you go back to five sixteen. In the last chapter, it said, Let your lights show so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And some people have pointed this out and said, Okay, you're supposed to live in such a way that people see the good things you do. And this one's saying, Don't do, your, don't do the good things in front of other people. It's kind of a contradiction. 
But the, the key, as we're looking at this, is Jesus is telling us, telling them to do these things. To have a pure heart, to be merciful, to, to let our light so shine, that li living our life out in such a way that people see our good deeds. But he's saying it, do it in such a way, like so shine, or do it in such a way that they see the good things you do. So they may be seeing the good things you do, but the glory is going to God somehow. And your intent is that the glory is going to God. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that is, uh, is key in understanding this, is that he's not saying you, that you can be all uh, secretive about how you live your life, but that what you're doing should bring glory to God, and that should be the intent of our heart. Um, one, one person wrote, this is quite consistent with not making a display of our righteousness for self-glorification. So we don't display our righteousness to be glorified in ourselves. In fact, if we are glorifying God, we're not going to be pointing to ourselves and allowing our motivation to be seen by men. I think it's fairly straightforward. And he goes on, the ver second verse, which is talking about <clears throat> hypocrites, right? Don't, when you do something right, righteous, don't sound a trumpet before you. And I don't know, they, they didn't really, couldn't really find any examples of people actually sounding a trumpet so that someone would actually see the good things they were doing. I thought of Paul Ryan. I don't know if you guys saw the last election, but probably a lot of politicians do this, but Paul Ryan was the guy, who was Paul Ryan? He's a Republican politician. Okay, what did he do that's significant in 2008 or 2012? <laughs> 2012, he ran with Mitt Romney. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. Said that. Said that. Anyway, he ran, he ran with Mitt Romney, okay? And he was a politician, and he, they showed him going to a, a soup kitchen in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so in the whole thing about him going to the soup kitchen, they said, Paul Ryan went to a soup kitchen in Chicago and helped out. And so they show him putting on the apron, going over to the potatoes or whatever it was, taking a spoonful, putting on a plate, and everybody clapped. Okay. <laughs> and then he took off the apron, put down the spoon, and walked away. Now, that's a good example, okay, I think, of somebody doing something to be seen by men. Um, and doing it, trumpeting it out there, like, here's the good charity I do as, as a politician. And it's so, uh, it was so transparent that obviously he didn't get elected, so. <laughs> Not just because of that, obviously. But anyway, I just thought, you know, like, when we do things in our life, we have to ask ourselves what the, human, what the motivation is. And, and, the, and the thing here saying, it says in verse 2, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Talking about these people that sound a trumpet when they do something righteous. Now, what does that mean? What do you guys think that means that it says uh, they have their reward? The instant gratification of people cheering for them. The instant gratification of people cheering for them. Yeah, that, that would be it, right? Mm -hmm. that, but what, what God is also, what Jesus is also saying is that they have that reward. That's all they get because I'm looking at them and there's no, I see the heart. God sees the heart. And he's saying, that's whatever you get out of that is all you're ever going to get. It's not going to be something that uh, merits anything with God. So it goes on. Verse 3 says, uh, when you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Um, the the basic gist of that is that we don't dwell on our own righteousness or the good thing we got. We don't we don't commend ourselves. We don't go away from the thing saying, 
man, I did pretty good, even though nobody saw me. You know, I, I'm such a nice guy. I'm such a great uh, <laughs> Christian because I gave up, gave this, or I did this, or I, I lived this out. And uh, this hypocrisy thing, you know, one guy put it this way: if we think we're not, we don't have this going on, that's a big part of the problem. <laughs> so you know, it's something to think about. We. I wrote down here, not only don't be ostentatious in doing good deeds, deeds, but don't dwell on your own awesomeness. <laughs> okay? Because that's going to lead to pride in your spiritual walk. So, it's kind of like the person who's really glad he doesn't brag like other people. And I've heard people say things like that. <laughs> so a lot of these guys are bragging. I, I never do that kind of thing. You know, so <laughs> I've heard somebody say almost that exact word. So this is fairly straight ahead. There's, that's the first section on, uh, on giving, basically giving, uh, charity, uh, doing a nice thing or a righteous thing for somebody. Any questions on that so far before we move on? What do you think, what's the reward of the Father? The Father who sees in secret will reward you. Well, um, I believe that when we go back, if you go back up to verse, <coughs> look back up in chapter 5, okay, and verse about, uh, 12, okay, mm -hmm. well, 11 and 12 together. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for, you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Mm -hmm. Now the reward in heaven, okay, that he's saying, he's talking about when, when we are persecuted for being righteous, is something we're supposed to be rejoicing and exceedingly glad about. Jesus tells us to do that. He says, be exceedingly glad about the reward in heaven. Now, it never says, Jesus never says what that reward is. He, he just says, first of all, back in verse uh, 10, it said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the, uh, the ones who are persecuted. And then it says, for my sake, when they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, not just for righteousness sake, but for my sake, then rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. It's, a, it's if, you're, if you're called out for being a Christian, uh, or you're persecuted in some way for being a Christian, there's a great reward in heaven. And that reward is something we're supposed to be exceedingly glad about and rejoice. And it doesn't really say what it is. But that what is what take, requires faith. We re, it requires faith in a God we believe that there's a God who sees what we're doing. It requires the kind of faith that, that says, even though all these things are hidden from people, these things I do for God, I have a faith that God is going to see that. And, uh, and so, when, so we go without seeing, seeing it all work out maybe sometimes. And there's a lot, a lot to be said about having <coughs> faith in Hebrews, about all the guys that... that had faith to do things, and some that died still having faith, and uh, so when we have, um, when we're told that the reward in about the reward in uh, chapter six, verse four, oh, I lost my. <laughs> I lost the internet connection. <laughs> Is it verse for you? That your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Do we have a faith that believes that God sees us in secret? And it's, it's where the reality of our faith comes in, because if we, if we kind of believe, well, I'm going to go along with this Christianity thing, I'm going to live like a Christian and go out there and be a Christian, because everybody around me is, and I'm kind of convinced of it, I, I got some belief in it, 
And so you do things to kind of be accepted in that group. A lot of people do that. Kids that grow up as uh, preacher's kids like I did do things like that. Mm. We, we know how to act in the group to fit in, but the reality of it shows up down the road. So, so we got to be careful that uh, we believe that God who sees in secret will reward us openly and does see us. So the way this breaks down a little bit is to see that don't do practice your righteousness in front of other people in order to be seen by them. And then it also kind of says, don't practice your righteousness to be glorified by yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's another, that's another aspect of this that it's really about um, being true to God. You know, I was up... <laughs> somebody, some of you know, I went and taught at this uh, youth conference. And so several people who knew about that they came up and they asked me, you know, how did it go? Just that kind of question, how did it go? And so I had to ask the question, okay, what happened was nobody got saved that I could tell if from my session. Nobody came up to me, I offered to, you know, share, you know, lead people to, uh, to Christ or to talk to them about uh, becoming a Christian or something. And nobody responded in that way. So that's the goal, right? Okay. But what happened was odd because after it was done and said the prayer, in several of the sessions, people started clapping. Okay? So I'm going, okay, well, if I tell people that they clapped, okay, when I was done the session, am I still trying to get in some glory for that? And then if I say, but I didn't really want them to clap, I wanted them to respond in a spiritual way. Am I also seeking glory by saying that? Do you see the, you see the dilemma? And if I say, you know, there's this real question you have to ask about your motives, okay? What are your motives in, in doing what you do? Because if the, if the motive is to draw people to Christ and give glory to Christ, then God sees that. That's the key. So even if somebody thought one way or thought another way, if God knows that I'm not being a hypocrite, if God knows that I'm not seeking glory, that's the key. So I think that that's, that's where we have to ask ourselves those kind of questions. Does God know I'm not seeking one of glory? Moving on, verse 5 it begins to talk about prayer. And it says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, be not like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So that's, that's five through eight. Now, there's, there's some key words in here that we need to look at. We, we see the picture that Jesus paints of, of people standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets. And apparently what they would used to do was uh, there were certain times of the day that they would go to the synagogues. Um, and so they would actually time their prayer and their, their ostentatious display of uh, uh, praying for when people were coming out of, out of the synagogue. And uh, they would just time it just right. And uh, so, and you know, they'd go to the corners of the streets where more, most people would be coming by, going each way, and they would pray. And uh, there's another example of this in the, in the gospel where a guy prayed, got out and prayed and said, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this, this sinner here. You know, things like that. And so, so, He's saying, uh, he's talking about going into the room, right? Now the room there, um, the word for the room, sometimes it's translated closet in, in some Bibles. And what it actually referred to was a room where people would seal off kind of and be very tight. It would be like a closet or a 
little room where they kept their valuable things, and they would they would seal that up pretty good, or you know, lock it up as best they could back in those days. And so he says, go into that little room where all your treasure is, and there pray. And I think he's kind of subtly saying, you got tre you think that that's important, the treasure. You need to be praying. Go into that little room where the treasures are kept and begin to pray. And believe that God, even though nobody else sees you in that little room, and some, they used to have the expression prayer closet, go into that prayer closet and pray, and God who sees in secret will, will reward you openly. Okay, Will reward you anyway. It says, when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. And the word that talks about, uh, it's actually the word, it kind, of, kind of means babble. It's kind of, it sounds like, um, sounds like there's blah, 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 that sort of kind of word. And so it's saying don't blah, 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 out of memory, out of repetition, the same things you've always said all the time. It says that's what, that's what people who don't have a God, don't have a revelation of God do meaning the Gentiles. When it says the Gentiles in, in the Bible, the, um, I'm not sure if the ESV says Gentiles mm -hmm. are a heathen. Gentiles. Gentiles? Okay. Gentiles were basically anybody, obviously, that wasn't Jewish, but it also referred to people who didn't have the revelation of God um, that the Jewish people had. And that was kind of the difference. It meant like and people without God. And so when he says Gentiles, when he refers to Gentiles, he's saying, don't be like them in thinking that just repeating this prayer over and over uh, is going to do you some good. Because you can repeat a prayer over and over, and it means nothing to you. It's not your heart, again. Okay? And God hears you. The other thing he's saying is, don't be like them because your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So he tells them, don't babble the same thing repetitiously, just thinking that you can say it over and over and over and uh, eventually something will happen. And also, don't, um, what was the other thing? <laughs> don't babble repetitiously. Empty phrases. Lost it. Okay. But don't be like that. Um, let it come from a pure heart. And it's interesting that when when you think of people re repeating a prayer <laughs> over and over and over again uh, without really thinking about it, uh, <coughs> the one that Jesus begins to pray and tells them how to pray is the one that people mm -hmm. actually end up repeating over and over <laughs> without meaning it, right? Oh, when I was in wow. elementary school, uh, we actually said this prayer. Canada, yeah, back in the 70s, late 70s, we actually got up and stood up in class and repeated this prayer. And I'm sure that almost 100% of the people in the classroom didn't know what we were talking about. Okay. It was first grade and we would say this prayer. And so it was just it was just rope. It was just uh, reciting it. And so that's the very thing Jesus say, don't do that. Don't use don't vainly repeat something like the heathen do. And when, when it comes to the prayer, it's something important to understand is that it's that there was no example in the rest of the New Testament or in history of people doing this or in the early part of history church history of people praying this particular prayer like they do in some churches. So I don't want us to attach too much to this, but Jesus is, is telling them how to pray. And he says, well, we'll get to that in a second, but I want to get back to this Gentile thing, okay? Don't be like the heathen or the Gentiles in the way they are. And, and uh, if you go back to Matthew 5.47, just look back and look at the <coughs> Bibles. And in this part, he's talking about loving your neighbor. And, uh, and in verse 46, he says, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? 
Now at the time, tax collectors were thought of highly like they are now. <laughs> but he says, even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? So in, uh, in some Bibles it says not just tax collectors, it says heathen. Okay? I'm not sure why in this one it says tax collectors. It's the right verse. Okay. <laughs> All right. But basically it's talking about people who don't know. Who right don't at the end, the verse 46 says, do not even tax collectors do the same, and 47 is do not even Gentiles or heathens. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I thought it's supposed to say. <laughs> Here, let me let me uh, switch this over. So we'll be on the same Bible. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Read the same Bible. <laughs> All right. So you see that in, in 547, um, do not even the Gentiles do the same. That's the same word there. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. And then in Matthew 632, further down in the chapter, in Matthew, Matthew 632, it says, he's talking about trusting God, and we'll be getting to this next week, I suppose. But it says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Now in each case, Jesus is comparing what, what they would do as people who had a revelation from God, who knew God, who God had revealed himself to. He says, this is how you're to be different. And in this one, he's saying, when you pray, you need to be different from the people who don't have a revelation of God. When you're loving, you have to be different than the regular people that have no revelation of God. And when you worry, when you trust God for things, it's a, another place to be different from people who don't have that, that revelation. So I think it's, whenever you see this, this phrase, the Gentiles are, as the Gentiles do, understand he's talking about there should be a difference in what we do. And we need to ask ourselves, how are we different from people who have no revelation of God? How are we living our lives that sees, that shows a difference in the way we go about all these different things, praying and trusting and loving? Have we, how far have we really risen above human nature? How far is our spiritual life gone because, as a result of us knowing Jesus? Those are some questions we need to ask. Because those are what Jesus is getting to in all these cases here. So then we get to the place where God, Jesus is talking about, we're back in, in chapter 6, verse 9. We're getting to the place where Jesus is talking about how God knows what, the Father knows what you need before he asks them. And in, uh, I like how, it put, how it's put in the ESV. When you pray, don't heap up empty phrases, okay? <laughs> or do vain repetitions or babblings. So, and then he says, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. He says, then he says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we, as, all, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you get, forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you trespasses. Now a couple of things about the prayer. That, that are interesting, that would have been different to the people listening to, to Jesus at that point, is he says our Father. And according to some people who comment on the Bible and, and study it a lot, this is the first time anybody had ever referred to God as the Father, our Father. And it was a familiar term, and some people have, uh, it's, it's like a close term, like a familiar term, it's not quite like really casual like daddy, but it is father. It is, and uh, I was over at the Cafe Delish the other day, and 
this lady was in the, was Shana? Shana? Oh, Shana was with me. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this lady that came in, there was a whole group of uh, family there. Uh, they were speaking Hebrew. And the lady calls out to, she says, Abba, do you want a bagel? <laughs> she just actually said the word Abba. And oh, that's cool, that's how they use it. I've never heard the word actually used in, in uh, you know, in, for real. And so that's how it's like, it, it's, it's a respectful term, a familiar term, a close term, but it's, it's also got reverence in it. And this is the first time anybody had ever used that term in praying to God. So he's saying, he said, there's some, somebody very close that we can call on just like we call on our Father. But he also says he's in heaven. There's a part of that that's at once he's close, but at the other point he's in heaven. We recognize there's heaven. There is a there is a distance. There's another worldliness. There's a transcendence to God that he's different from us. He's above us. And we, we acknowledge that he's in heaven. So it says, your kingdom come. Um, that's just asking that God's kingdom come in the lives of people on earth, but also looking forward to the ultimate rule of Jesus on earth. It's kind of just recognizing that God's kingdom is coming. And so you're, you're, you're wanting to see that. You're wanting that to happen. It says, you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's just a desire to see the whole world brought in conformity to God's will. You're wanting this world. It's not saying it's going to happen, uh, that God's perfect will is going to be done on earth, but you, you want it to happen. So it starts up here. God in heaven, wanting the kingdom to come, wanting his will to be done. And, then he, and they're all about God. And that's the first three things that it's saying. Then the next four things are about us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. And in this, in this con context, it's talking about our sin debt. Okay? The debt of sin that we have. As we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. A little bit about le leading us not into temptation. That's not saying, God, don't ever put me in a place where I'm tempted. That's we have to understand, well, it is kind of saying that, but it's understanding that God is going to allow temptation in our life. But it's an acknowledging of our weaknesses. It's saying, you know, I could be led astray. I could have that tendency to sin, and I don't want to sin. And I want to avoid it altogether. And so I don't want to be led into temptation. It's, it's, uh, it's something to say, I, I, I want to be from sin. I want to be forgiven from sin, but I also don't want to have, have it keep coming at me. And so we're asking God to, to, to keep us from it. Okay? Then deliver us from evil. Um, there's a verse, could somebody read 2 Timothy 4, 18? Uh, the delivering from evil is basically basically a, a statement of Okay, I want to be, I don't want evil to be in my life. I don't want it to be harmed by evil. And it's also looking ahead to when we are completely, finally delivered from evil. Somebody read 2 Timothy 4, 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, there it is there. The Lord will deliver me from every evil deed. So, um, I think it's 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 saying that that the things that are evil that are coming against me, the things that are evil that are, might happen to me, God is going to protect me from that. It's, it's ultimately protection, and it's also looking ahead to heaven. So, um, deliver us from evil. So basic, uh, basically, fairly straight ahead, there's four peti three petitions about God, four petitions about ourselves and our needs, going from our basic daily needs, whatever we need in our life, to our sin, 
and then not wanting to sin anymore and ultimately being delivered from evil. And so it kind of climbs the sins into the better things. Now in all these things, it's important to realize that Jesus doesn't say, pray. And now when you pray, do this. He's assuming that everybody prays. He's assuming that these things go on as, as believers. Um, and so we get to the one about fasting now. And fasting is something that, well, let's, let's read it first, then I'll, I'll say, it, say it a few things about it. Verse 16, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So fasting is a time where we try to draw close to God by showing our commitment to Him, by, by abstaining from food, so that we can, you know, the way I've had it described is that the abstaining from food makes you think about food, and when you think about food, you're supposed to think about God <laughs> and begin to pray. Uh, fasting was something that just brought the body into subjection to the Spirit. It, it, it kind of makes you rely on God, pray to God, and uh, not be about a physical thing. And, what would happen at the time of the Jewish Jewish people, uh, the Pharisees and, and different ones that would fast, is that they would they would do ex extremely. If if going without food was good, we they'd have to take it one step further to show how great it was, how great they were good at doing it, you know. And uh, they wouldn't only abstain from food, but they would also wouldn't shave. They wouldn't wash their clothes. They wouldn't. They wouldn't put anything on their faces to you know, keep the dust down, or you know, they wouldn't anoint themselves. They would. They wouldn't wash their face. They wouldn't have sex. They would just avoid everything, and they would kind of show that out. You know, that would be their kind of badge of honor. By, oh wow, look at how he's fasting. It kind of sounds a little lazy, to be honest. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but they would actually abstain from a lot of things that would probably be, be pleasurable and, uh, and that their body needed, and they would, they would show it. And so basically Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't walk around. And also they would actually put on a sad face. They would have to... Uh, they would just almost practice a sad, a sad face. And we have a word for it, and uh, they have a word for it in Sioux. It's called ushika. They look ushika. You could look that up in the Sioux dictionary. <laughs> Can you show an example of ushika? <laughs> Can you tell them an example of ushika? <coughs> uh, we, our family uses it a lot. So if somebody is like uh, feeling sorry for themselves, or you're like, uh, mm -hmm. oh, you're just being ushika. You know, if, like you, you're saying, well, have to do this and then this happened, whatever. Uh, but yeah. they're overboard, they're self pity. So you can play self, yeah, yeah. It's self pity, it's self -pity. but also there's an element of. Um, we can also use it like there is this tree. I, I use it to describe a tree that it looked like a, it looked like someone pushed it over, but it just grew that way. It looked like a really sad looking tree. Uh, so I said that trees is mushika. It's just kind of this word. That, so that's 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 kind of what it, what he's saying that there was a sad countenance to their face. It kind of they would put that on in order to be thought of as spiritual. And uh, there's there's variations of that actually. As I grew up, there was variations of that in church. You know, where people would would act so serious and and and, uh, and just like they were really downtrodden, so that. I don't know, it's just to kind of make themselves look holy, that smiling wasn't a big thing. And um, so Jesus is saying, don't do that. Put put some oil on your head, wash your face, wash your clothes, <laughs> whatever. Uh, do, do something, that, he says, don't let it even be seen by others. 
that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. So now we have all three things, uh, the fasting, the giving, uh, and the praying, are all, we're told, not to show them off to people, not to do them in such a way as to be seen, and to try to be, avoid being seen. Well, in a lot of ways, we're going to be seen. Um, but Jesus is saying, well, I want this to be real. And back in 520, if you look at this, it says that our righteousness is supposed to exceed that of the Pharisees. I don't have it written down on this point. Too. But um, our, our righteousness was to exceed that of the people who were thought to be the most um, righteous. Mm -hmm. And for our righteousness to exceed the Pharisees, we have to have a righteousness that is real before God. It's the one who really knows your heart. Now Jesus at this point is not being talking about how he's going to impute his righteousness to us as believers. That's not in, in view yet. But he's saying there's something that you need to you need to do. It has to be far greater than just the, the church that you're practicing now or the things you're doing now. It has to be far beyond that where you are really, here is the ideal. And again, he's calling us to the character of the Father. And he's calling us to the ideal. He's not calling us to just do the things that are, that are righteous. He's saying, go way beyond that and have it be a real thing in your life. And so, so eventually we understand that we need the righteousness of Christ that he gives to us when he died on the cross. We need, to, we need that, to trust in that, to be, to be right before God, because obviously perfect righteousness like this is talking about is pretty hard to do <laughs> and very, uh, let's say, impossible to do. Even if, even if we've done everything good on the outside and everybody else around us looks good, Jesus is saying, it's all those things you do in secret that I'm concerned about. <laughs> and, and we know that for a lot of times, uh, that isn't what, what, what's driving our righteousness. That isn't what's driving our, our, uh, our doing good. The need for a faith that acknowledges God's omniscience involves doing things that are not designed to elicit praise from other people or make ourselves look, look spiritual, but to receive praise from God. And so... So a couple questions. Um, just we need to ask ourselves. Maybe we're just going to take some time. Um, do we live like we believe that God knows our secret life? Do we actually live like we believe that God sees in secret? That, that's, that's a personal question. Nobody can answer that for us. Nobody can answer that for me or anyone else. But do we live like we believe that God knows our secret life? Another question is, how many of the righteous things that we do would we continue to do if nobody ever knew about them? Honest, being honest with ourselves. How many of the righteous things that we do, we know they're good, we know that they're right, would we continue to do if nobody ever knew about it? In 1 Corinthians 4, 5, there's a verse that says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness. In other words, the secret things. The things we thought nobody knew. Even, you know, completely personal things. And, He's going to do two things. He's going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart or the motives of the heart. So he's going to bring out what was in the darkness and he's going to reveal the motives of why we did what we did, even if it was good things. And then it says, then each one's praise will come from God. Mm. Well, we have praise from God. That's the point. And then this is going to happen even as Christians. The Bible says that there's a time when we'll, when we'll come before God to get our reward. 
for rewards. And uh, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. Not, not whether we'll go to heaven or hell, it's there's a time when God's going to judge our lives as believers. And that's a sobering thought to me, for sure. Um, hopefully to all of us. <laughs>